The United States is trying to cope with the worst drought for 50 years. Some states are drier than they've been since the Great Dust Bowl disaster of the 1930s, and thousands of farmers are facing ruin. Floods in Bangladesh have now claimed almost 500 lives. Half a million people have had their homes swept away and millions more are marooned in their villages surrounded by water. British submarines sailing under the Arctic Circle have collected evidence that the polar ice is melting much faster than previously thought. Scientists say it's the first concrete evidence of the effect of global warming. Britain's rescue services are working through the night before another severe storm hits parts of the country tomorrow. In the United States, around 700 people are now believed to have died as a result of the week-long heat wave, and it's feared more victims will be discovered in the coming days. Search complete. Global warming. Location, London. Year 2050. Simulation. Prediction. Flooding, 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 flooding. Disaster isn't likely to strike in the very near future, but global warming is giving genuine cause for concern. Scientists generally agree that the Earth has warmed by about half a degree over the last century. But there's less agreement about why this has happened, how much warming we'll see in the future, and what the knock-on effects of any increase in global temperature might be. With all this uncertainty, should we be taking steps now to prevent further global warming in the future? The Earth's temperature varies between night and day, from one season to another, and from the poles to the equator. But our planet has an average global temperature of about 15 Celsius. The Earth is kept warm by the gases in the atmosphere. Without them, it would be over 20 degrees below zero, which is far too cold to support life. We don't know for certain how the early atmosphere evolved, but we can make intelligent guesses based on evidence from rocks and fossils. We think that about 4,600 million years ago, the Earth evolved from a swirling mass of dust and gases, just like Jupiter is today. The early Earth would have been a molten mass of volcanoes and hot magma. We think that its atmosphere would have consisted mainly of carbon dioxide and water, because these are the gases given out by volcanoes today. Levels of oxygen built up very slowly, when there was enough, about 600 million years ago, then life exploded on this planet. And since then, the atmosphere has hardly changed at all. The Earth's atmosphere helps it to retain energy, which arrives from the sun in the form of electromagnetic waves. Most of these waves have very short wavelengths, like the ultraviolet radiation, which gives you a suntan. Some radiation is reflected back into space, but most of it is absorbed by the Earth's surface. This has a warming effect. Like any warm object, the Earth's surface radiates heat. The radiation goes back out towards space, but this time the radiation is of a longer wavelength. It's in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This results in a cooling effect, but some of the infrared waves are trapped by certain gases in the atmosphere. This radiation is then re-emitted, and some of it gets back to the Earth's surface, so the atmosphere keeps the Earth's surface warmer than it would be otherwise. This is the greenhouse effect. Overall, the Earth and its atmosphere receive and give off exactly the same amount of radiation, so the Earth stays at a steady temperature. But without the greenhouse effect, this temperature would be much lower.
the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. The gases that cause the greenhouse effect are contained in the remaining 1%. The main ones are carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour. Although the greenhouse gases form a tiny proportion of the atmosphere, they are vital to our survival. Over the last century, industrial nations have been releasing more and more CO2 by burning fossil fuels like oil and coal. Scientists in Hawaii have been making precise measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide since the 1950s. The peaks and troughs reflect the seasons each year, but the general trend is an increase in carbon dioxide levels, and it's this greenhouse gas that scientists are most concerned about. If additional carbon dioxide is enhancing the natural greenhouse effect, and scientists predict an increase in average global temperature of between 1 and 5 degrees by the end of the next century. But where's the evidence? How do we know that greater CO2 levels in the atmosphere are associated with an increase in temperature? The answer lies locked deep in the ice layers of the polar regions. This is an ice core from Antarctica. Each year in the Antarctic, snowfall traps a sample of the atmosphere. Deep within the ice, it can be several hundred thousand years old, and within bubbles in the ice are samples of the ancient air. For the people studying past climate, Antarctica really is a very special laboratory. It's very remote from anywhere else, and it's largely untouched by human activity. This makes it very clean for the work we do, and its remoteness means that we tend to get a global view of the temperature change, not a purely local one. The other thing is we can go time after time. The ice is there forever. As our techniques improve, we can go back again and again to collect more ice cores. for analysis. The first step is cutting them on the saw. We then have to extract the gas from the air bubbles. If you look very carefully you'll be able to see the air bubbles. Each of these is a bubble of the ancient atmosphere. Normally we would extract the gas in very controlled circumstances but here if I just warm it carefully for you you may be able to hear the little bubbles popping. From the composition of the air trapped in bubbles in the ice, we can tell what levels of gases were in the atmosphere in the past. In particular, we're interested in carbon dioxide and methane, the two main greenhouse gases. But also, by careful analysis of the meltwater itself, we can tell the temperature history over the same period. Here I have a graph of the temperature and the carbon dioxide over the last 160,000 years. You can see that in general there's broad agreement between the two, when the carbon dioxide levels are high the temperature is high. In the colder ice age period, the carbon dioxide is significantly lower. If we concentrate for a moment on this last 10,000 years, you can see that the temperature variation has been remarkably low. A lot lower than the increase we might expect over the next 100 years from greenhouse warming. However, if we go further back into the past, you can see the variability was a lot higher. For example, this peak here shows a temperature increase of maybe 8 or 10 degrees over a period of only a few tens of years. Now this is really quite remarkable and it puts into perspective the next hundred year warming of two or three degrees. That is well within the climate variability that we have seen over this longer period of time. We're pretty confident about the temperature and carbon dioxide data we've taken from our ice cores. We'd like to go further back into the past now and for that we need data from deep sea sediments and perhaps even tree rings. These are tree rings in a piece of fossil wood. And the interesting thing about this wood is that these rings are extremely narrow, less than a millimetre in width, so we need to use a microscope to study them. They come from this piece of fossil wood, which is 100 million years old and now petrified to stone. And we can tell from these narrow rings that this tree must have grown very slowly under a cold climate. And if we compare that to a piece of wood from a tree growing in England today, we can see that these rings are much wider and the climate was much warmer.
And it's from the study of tree rings that we can tell that throughout Earth history, the climate has always fluctuated very dramatically. So, we've seen that the composition of the atmosphere appears to have an effect on the world's climate, but the sea also has an important role to play. The oceans cover over two-thirds of the Earth's surface, and we now know that they have a major effect on the Earth's climate. They're important because they store heat in the ocean waters and then transport it around the Earth in ocean currents. They also contain large amounts of carbon, both as marine plants and as dissolved carbon dioxide in the water. This interacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, with marine plants that live on the ocean surface, and with sediment at the bottom of the ocean to form part of a very complex carbon cycle. The level of carbon dioxide in the air depends on many different processes. Photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide as a raw material to produce sugars, so plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Both animals and plants get their energy by respiration, a chemical reaction which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, but this is a two-way process. When the sea gets warmer, some of the carbon dioxide comes out of solution and passes back into the atmosphere. Natural processes like the